All right, so in this video we're going to be looking at uh, essentially a few conic sections, and you'll notice that they have uh, X and Y terms in them. And what we want to do is we want to remove those X and Y terms by essentially uh, just rotating around the set of axes that we have. So we're given an equation here, 13X squared plus 6 square root 3XY plus 7Y squared takes 64 square root 3X, Take 64y plus 240 equals 0. Now, a key thing is to remember this form up here. Uh, x transpose ax plus kx plus c is equal to 0. It's going to come in handy when we're looking for things in this form. It has an xy, has an x squared, has a y squared, has an x, has a y, and a constant. We're going to fit it into that form, and then we're going to manipulate that form with the x transpose, the a, the k, and the c. So remember that formula on the top of the page there. But first off, we want to, you know, um, figure out how we can simplify this equation um, a little bit so that we can get something nice out of it and so we can actually evaluate this and uh, get rid of that xy term. So to get rid of that xy term, we've got to think about finding a diagonal matrix, and that means that we've got to find P, which is an orthonormal matrix, um, and that orthonormal matrix will help us get rid of that xy term. Because that xy term just there, 6 square root 3 xy, that's basically stopping us from having a really intuitive way of being able to draw this conic, or be able to work with this conic. Because we're really used to dealing with x squareds and y squareds, and then completing the square. In this case, the xy is really stopping us. So that's what we want to get rid of. And the way we get rid of that is using eigenvalues and eigenvectors and normalizing them. So we start with the matrix A. The way we get A is we take the coefficient of x squared that forms our element 1, 1. We then halve this 6 square root 3 here. Sorry about the lighting there. Uh, we halve it so we get 3 square root 3, and that forms those two positions along the diagonal there from those two. So half of the coefficient of xy goes in there. And then the coefficient of y squared, which is just 7, goes in there. So now what we want to do is we want to solve for the eigenvalues associated with that matrix A that we just found. So remember, we just found A by looking at those coefficients there. Oop. Yep. Doesn't like it when I put my hand there. Keep that in mind. So, 0 is equal to determinant of lambda i take A. So that, what that basically means is lambda take uh, 13 we get, because we're just doing uh, essentially identity with lambdas down the diagonal. So we're going to get lambda take 13 by evaluating lambda i take a. And we're going to get negative there, because we imagine that there's just going to be a zero there in the normal identity matrix, and we're just taking off a, so it's becoming negative. Same with that uh, position there, and then we have lambda take 7. So now... The next thing we need to do is we need to get some light so we can actually see what we're going to do. Um, next part is to actually find the eigenvalues. So we can expand this. We get lambda squared take 7 lambda, take 13 lambda plus uh, 91, because 13 times 7 is 91. Then it's take 3 square root 3 squared. And, uh, yeah, the lighting really isn't liking me today. What happens if I put it up there? Yeah, that's much better. Sorry about that. Um, so we can simplify negative 7 lambda and negative 13 lambda to be negative 20 lambda. Um, then from here we can simplify this out, so 3 squared and square root 3 squared, so it's really just 9 times 3, 27. So this is really just a bit of arithmetic here. What we're going to do when we collect like terms is we're going to get lambda squared take 20 lambda plus 64. Uh, you can factorize this using the quadratic formula if you would like, or you can use your calculator or technology, or you can sort of think what are two things that sum 220 and have a product of 64. In this case, there aren't too many things that have a product of 64. Clearly, 8 and 8 doesn't work. Um, you, you could try 32 and 2, that wouldn't work really to get a sum of negative 20. So 16 and 4 is a safe bet that you should come across reasonably quickly, but you can always, you know, use quadratic formula or anything you like. So what that really means is that our eigenvalues lambda 1 and lambda 2 are equal to 16 and 4 respectively. So now that we've got eigenvalues, we need to find our eigenvectors, and the way we do that is we actually evaluate lambda i take a. 
uh, as we have up there, but we evaluate it um, with the eigenvalues. So I'm looking at E16 here, which is the, uh, oops, sorry for the wobbly camera work there. E16 is eigenspace um, evaluated when lambda equals 16. So all I've done is I'll plug 16 into here, so 16 take 13 gives us our free, and uh, lambda being 16, 16 takes 7 gives us 9. We put this in reduced rational form using our calculator. We could use elementary row operations, but calculator is quicker. We get that, and hence we get the eigenvector. What we do is we look at the solution space. We have a free variable here, and we have a pivot column. Free variable, that, that's going to form t. And then when we move that to the other side, it's going to be really, when we think about solution space, square root 3 and 1 multiplied by t, obviously. We just want that vector, because it's just a solution vector we take, so it's square root 3 and 1 in our eigenvectors there. So now we do the same for the other eigenspace, and we found eigenvalue lambda equals 4, or to be more specific, lambda 2 equals 4, our second eigenvalue there. And I just put 4 into my matrix here, so 4 take 13, that's negative 9. We end up with everything being negative, it's a very negative matrix. We then row reduce it in the way we usually do. We get this, and we do the same thing. We see oop, free variable and a pivot column variable there. So obviously set they equal to t, so we're going to have t, and then that's going to be moved to negative, because we imagine setting this equal to zero. We imagine the homogeneous system of this matrix. Uh, so what we're going to end up with is like 1x is equal to negative 1 on square root 3t, and obviously um, y here, for example, y is equal to t. And that's why we get this uh, eigenvector here. This is really going to be a pain to work with, because we've got a nasty square root 3 in the denominator there, and that's just going to get really yucky when we try to normalize these vectors. And it's very important we normalize them, because uh, what we really want to do is find uh, a matrix that is normalized, because that's what's going to diagonalize um, our uh, matrix and that's what's going to get rid of our xy. So really what we do is we scale everything up, we multiply both the components by square root 3, so square root 3 and square root 3 we're just going to get negative 1, and when we multiply 1 by square root 3 we just get square root 3. Hence these two vectors by definition are well, linearly independent, and uh, they are orthogonal because they are two eigenvectors belonging to a matrix, so it'll always be orthogonal. We can just do that quick check by taking the dot product. So take that component, square root 3 times negative 1, that's negative square root 3, and we have 1 times square root 3, so it's negative square root 3 plus square root 3. That's clearly 0, so um, yes, but that will always be the case. When we have two vectors that we have found from a uh, eigen, um, from the, sorry, eigenvalues, then they will always be orthogonal. The key thing we need to do is normalize them so they're orthonormal. We go from orthogonal eigenvectors to orthonormal eigenvectors. Orthonormal means, yes, they are still perpendicular, just like uh, what we had with orthogonal, but now they must have a length of 1. So when we think about these eigenvectors, what we do to work out length, just divide by their length, really, to normalize it. Um, but to, in order to get their length, we essentially square each component. In this case, this is going to be the square root of 3 squared, which is just 3, plus 1 squared, which is just 1, so we're going to get 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. So that's how we get this vector here. We do the same thing for the other vector. It's pretty straightforward. And then what we do is we get the matrix P, and note I have put the eigenvectors as the columns of the matrix P for our orthonormal matrix. Uh, and notice I've just gone the other way. I've taken the smallest eigenvalue, E4, and I've plugged that in as the first column there. And then I've taken the E16, and I've plugged that in as the second column there. And it's very important to remember that, because when we diagonalize X in our original equation, which I'm about to do, uh, we should see that we should get a 4 and a 16 there. So 4 there and a 16 there, because eigenvalues have to correspond to the columns with their eigenvectors. So think about these eigenvalues being in pairs with their eigenvectors. That's the best way to think about it. So now here comes the next little bit. What we're really doing is uh, we are imagining x as being p x prime. We're just saying, okay, some x that we have in this final form here with the x, y's in it, so with the square, uh, 6 square root 3 x, y in that, um, that, that is just some x that we had there, some x vector consisting of components x and y. But now what we want to do is we want to find x equal to uh, p x prime. So we had some x prime 
and then we multiplied it by p, and p is really just a linear transformation. This is p here. That matrix there is just a linear transformation. All we are doing is we are just rotating these conics about. That's how we get the xy terms, because we're rotating them. But now we're going back the other way, essentially. So that's what I mean. When I say x is equal to px prime, I'm basically saying x prime is, is the rotated version of x. P is basically a linear transformation, and it's what does the rotation. It's like a standard matrix for a linear transformation. Okie dokie, let's go over the page. Keep that in mind, because I'm about to substitute this back into this. So as I said at the beginning of this video, remember this. This is what you need to remember. Okie dokie. So, I just said x is now px prime. So wherever there was an x before, I've just put px prime. So px prime t, um, and then, yep, we get that. px, yep, px prime, yep, all in there. Now what I do is I, uh, whoops, wobbly camera. Uh, I take the x prime t, oh, God, I'm getting more wobbly. I take the x prime and I transpose it. So remember when we have brackets like this, we always take the second one in the matrix and the first one. So I get x prime t, p t, a p x prime plus k p x prime plus c equals zero. Now, here's a really important property. p t equals p inverse for orthonormal matrices. True for all orthonormal matrices. There's a theorem in your book that will clarify this. But what we do is we use that property, and what we get is we get the x prime transpose p inverse a p x prime. So all I've really done here is, look, I got p transpose there, and now I got p inverse there. So remember, I just recapping, I just substituted in p x prime wherever there was an x in that original one equation I said was very important. And now I'm just saying, oh, there's a pt there, that's now a p inverse, just based on the fact that we have an orthonormal matrix, p is an orthonormal matrix, and that property p transpose equals p inverse is true for orthonormal matrices. So now what we end up with is xt p inverse a p x prime plus k p x prime plus c, quite a mouthful. But we know that p inverse a p is a diagonal matrix, and that was proved in a previous theorem. So maybe worth remembering that whenever you see p inverse ap, I like to think of it as p inverse app, then you get the diagonal matrix. And remember how I had my eigenvector for 4 in the first column and my eigenvector for 16 in the second column? Well, my diagonal matrix has to have the eigenvalues that match up with that. So I've got 4, 0 in the first column and 0, 16 in the second column for my matrix D. So now I've got x prime transpose, 4, 0, 0, 16, x prime plus k p x prime plus c equals 0. I've just put in where p inverse ap was. That's now where my diagonal matrix D is. So now x prime t for, yep, all of that. Um, what I'm doing is I'm substituting in k, and k is negative 64 square root 3 and negative 64. You're probably wondering, well, how did you get that? How did you work that out? Well, this k, ve oh, this k matrix here, what it is, is we're dealing with the x squareds, x, y, and the y squareds with the first bit here. That little bit deals with all of them. The k deals with the x and the y's. And the c, that's just our constant here, yeah? 240 in this case, the one that doesn't have x's and y's in it. So our k, what we do is it's really easy. We just take the coefficient of x, so negative 64 square root 3, and then the coefficient of y, negative 64, and they become the two components of that matrix. It's really straightforward. And then from there, I also take my matrix P. I multiply that K that I just told you how to find, and P together, and it's multiplied by X prime as well, but we don't really care about that just yet. Uh, what we get is we get 0 and negative 128. So I've just substituted everything in here. Now X prime is really just X prime Y prime as a components there. So really what we see here is, well, we've got x's there, we've got an x prime there and an x prime there. So this is going to form our x prime squared terms. Now notice we've got two zeros here. If we add numbers there, like we did with our original a matrix, then we would end up with x, y terms. But because we've got zeros there, which is what we've been trying to do all along, get rid of that xy term, we have got rid of that xy term, because we've got a 0 there and 0 there. So we're going to end up with is 4x prime prime, uh, sorry, x prime x prime, 
which is for x prime squared. So we just got x prime squared there. Now remember x prime and y prime are just redefined variables. We just rotated that nexus, and we can always get back to them, and I'll explain that in another video. Um, but now what we also consider is we've got x prime and y prime there. Uh, we we'll, we consider this component here as always being x prime squared. You could do the matrix multiplication and work it out, but uh, just trust me, it's probably better. And then what you have is y prime there and y prime there, so we've got 16 y prime squared. We continue on to the other side, so we've got 0 x prime and negative 128 y prime, and our constant c, it remains unchanged in this whole process. So what we've got is exactly what I've got there. We've got rid of x, y. We now have x prime squared and y prime squared and y. We don't have an x prime in here because it was 0 in that matrix there, matrix k. Now we complete the square. So we only need to complete the square and y, so... I guess uh, what we see is we've got 16y prime squared, then we can factor out 8 there. So, sorry, we factor out 16 and we're left with 8. So it becomes y prime squared take 8y prime. And 240, if we factor 16 out of that at the front, we're going to be left with 15. And then clearly to complete the square, we're going to need to add 1. This video won't be about completing the square because uh, it's already pretty long. Um, but then we've got to remember what we do to one side, so in this case we've added 1 there, but we've actually added 16, 16 out the front, so we've got to add 16 to the other side. Then when we divide through by 16, we end up with this, and we can see we've got a major axis, radi uh, a major axis radius, that's what we see with the last term here, because we know this is an ellipse, because there's a plus sign in the middle, it's not a minus sign, so we know it's an ellipse, and then we've got the minor axis there. Remember, I've got to rewrite that as being a squared in the denominator. So our minor axis radius is, is a. And what we're really looking at is uh, an ellipse centered on 0, 4 with those two properties. And what we've really done rotation-wise, and I won't go into this in this video too much, but there was our ellipse that we just found. And the one that we started with is somewhere like that. So all we've done is rotated it to get it nice like that so that we no longer have an xy product term. So hopefully this video made a lot of sense. If you've got any questions, please let me know. Um, but there it is. There is going through the process of uh, actually getting an ellipse in standard form from something that's very far from standard form using concepts of symmetric matrices and orthogonal matrices. Um, thank you for watching.